Welcome to Labor Vision, the at-home edition. I am your host, Autumn Gia, and with me today are Matthew Gunnup, the president of SEIU Local 580, and Rafael Martinez, president of Ask Me Local 2882. Hi to both of you. Thank you so much for coming on to Labor Vision. Uh, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Autumn. So today we're going to talk about an issue that is affecting both of your memberships, which is a staffing problem at DHS. Um, I was hoping that you both could give us a little bit of background about what the actual issue is um, and who your members are. Like, why is this a problem? Sure, I'm happy to answer that question. Uh, I believe Harrington started during the COVID uh, period 2020. Uh, as you know, the country was in a lockdown. Um, most uh, private businesses, they started uh, telework in order to continue the workflow in, in uh, the United States. And for government agencies such as ours, uh, we, we tried to, we were slow to implement that process because uh, most of our, our workers, the frontline workers, they also have families and children. Uh, when those services was uh, halted for themselves, they were, it was very difficult for them to come into work. And since 2020, 2021, we saw a mass exodus of public employees leaving state government, good paying jobs, because they, their primary uh, need is to provide for their families and children. As you know, the schools were in lockdown, uh, daycare centers were in lockdown. So that made it difficult for the working class, moms and dads who have children at home to be at work because they, they need to, to provide and, and care for the children. To the present, uh, we, we lost about roughly close to 70 positions, frontline workers at DHS. And that has affected the state and the services that DHS provides to the, you know, to the public. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, what compounded that issue is that the state did uh, a retirement incentive yes. uh, during COVID uh, when they knew that there's a, a staffing shortage throughout human services in general. Um, so why they went down that path, uh, knowing that uh, we had issues with staffing, we've lost the agency, I should say, lost approximately 40 people with institutional knowledge. So that was uh, a problem that could have uh, been avoided and it just had exasperated the issue that uh, mm -hmm. Raphael's talking about. So um, you both represent folks at DHS. And you're talking about these different positions that have been lost. So the issue now is that these positions have not really been filled, right? They haven't been backfilled. Uh, roughly around 40 frontline workers, those are the, 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 the folks that are represented at DHS. They are the ones that actually authorize the benefits. Uh, we lost about 44, 48 eligibility uh, technicians. The other folks who actually do the interview with the applicant and they authorize the benefits for the families who need those benefits. Uh, around roughly 40 of them uh, left. And to leave, to train a worker to have knowledge and clear knowledge uh, for, for the federal guidelines and state guidelines and state laws to, in order to authorize the benefits, they said there's a learning curve of roughly a year and a half to four years. It depends which program. Example, uh, let's use SNAP. Uh, to be versed in the SNAP, SNAP benefits, an employee has to go six months of training. Then under, after the six months of training, they had to do uh, under watch five of, of their superior for a year, year and a half, about constant training and update the, you know, the policy state changes that the federal government uh, brings down to all the state agencies. Uh, not one family is the same. There's a lot of scenarios that they need to be aware of, a lot of laws they need to be aware of because they are constantly changing by, by the feds. And so the learning curve is about a year and a half to two years for the SNAP benefits. For the Medicaid program, it's about three years, that's the same learning curve. Child care is the easiest one because it's based on income only. While the other, while the other programs, basically, they're not, part of, they're not, they're not income only uh, by themselves. So it's... It is a, a learning curve. It, that, that's what we call it institutional knowledge because you just can hire someone off the street 
expected to, to determine eligibility for a family of five or a family of four or three and so on. Because you have to, if it's not one family is unique. So it takes time to master the eligibility process within DHS. Yeah, we, we had a, um, or DHS had an oversight hearing in February uh, before the uh, House Oversight uh, Committee. And that was uh, February 17th. And at that point, they identified 71 frontline worker positions that uh, they said that they would fill um, by the end of April. Um, at that time, they stated that uh, as of January 2022, there was 875 um, total uh, positions filled, but 978 are funded. So that's 103 vacancies. So on April 23rd, the state had reported to the legislature uh, that was April 23rd that DHS had um, 864 uh, positions filled. That's a net loss of 11 positions since January um, as reported by DHS. But they are also stating that, oh, we filled 49 of those 71 positions, mm -hmm. um, which is basically moving the chairs around the deck of a Titanic. Um, they'll say, hey, we have systemic challenges uh, you know, with, with hiring um, and filling vacancies. And that's their message to everybody. But the truth is, from information we got from the Department of Administration, um, and we didn't even get the total information we requested, but out of about 40 positions, um, about, out of about 40 positions, um, I'm sorry, out of a, about 60 positions, about 42 of them, the, the position went vacant anywhere between 100, approximately 150 days to over 600 days before they advertise the position. So we have like a list of, we have a list of that. So that's not, hey, we're having a challenging filling vacancies. That's, hey, we went between 150 days and 600 days before we advertised the position that went vacant. Um, and that's a really, that's a, that's a, a big issue because that's not the narrative um, that the state is uh, communicating. And we're hoping to, uh, you know, correct the record here and with the policymakers, because unless we're looking at all the facts and dealing with the same set of facts, um, then that's not going to, that's not going to tell the right narrative. And if we don't address the crux of the problem, how are we going to fix it? Correct. So I, I just want to circle back to that because you just laid out so many important like data points, Matt. Um, so the first one, your analogy of shuffling around seats on the Titanic, you talked about their hiring of employees. Is it that they did internal hire so they didn't actually fill the vacancies? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Ra Raphael uh, answer I will, I will answer that question. Okay, yeah. they, do this, they promote uh, employees within. Uh, we have tier system within uh, the eligibility process, ET1, 2, and 3. Uh, the ET1, those are the first, uh, those are the first year's uh, ETs. They're, about, they're, they're still in the learning curve. They haven't mastered all the programs. So it, the first year, two years, or three years, I would say, they, they do the basic process of the applications that, that are entering into the system, the basic eligibility, not the most complex type of eligibility. Uh, then we have the ET2s where after three years of uh, doing eligibility, they get promoted to ET2. They, they, they post a position because they, they have the specific skills that is needed to, to, uh, to process more complex uh, applications with more complex uh, and nuances within a family. Like I said before, a family of five, you can, you can have five, five families for five children and there, it will be a different results based on the family needs. So there's no computer system that can build to get that, get that going. So it's, it takes a human uh, person to make that determination. So that, that once a person reaches ET1 to ET2, that's a higher level, then you, get, you can apply for position at a higher level and then there's ET3. So what they're doing is they are promoting people with experience to higher uh, pay grade to do more complex eligibility. Yeah, so they are promoting within, mm -hmm. but the backfill they ha uh, has, not, has not been done completely at all. Like I said before, we have 49 positions empty you know, since 2020, 2021, that the agency has not filled out at all. Yeah, they are telling the public, they're telling the General Assembly and the Senate and the governor, yes, we're hiring. No, they're not. They are promoting within. It's a, it's a big difference is, you know, uh, backfill or a new hire, then internal promotion of within. 
They call it, we're hiring within. It, it's not really hiring. It's just a promotion, internal promotions. Yeah, so the, the narrative is filled positions. Hey, right. we filled 49 of 71 positions. But the real metric is how many net positions they are. And going by the state's own numbers that they provide, you know, that they, that they gave the legislature, that they, between January and April 23rd, they had a net loss of 11 positions. But they don't say that. They say, we had to find that out through digging. <laughs> um, and by the way, this is manufactured. So the, the, the hiring process hasn't like changed, just like they knew that, hey, when they do a retirement incentive, they're going to lose 40 people and all this institutional knowledge. So they, didn't, they knew that and they didn't respond to it. And if you have a position that went vacant on April 24th, 2020, right? That's two years ago. And if they didn't, if they didn't post it or advertise it until January 19th, 2022, um, which is over 600 days, like what, what is the crux of the issue? They, they intentionally did not take the first action or step um, to fill a position. Now they're scrambling um, because um, you know, the legislature uh, and the media has been reporting on it, but, but even with that, they're not still acknowledging the fact that we have a net loss of positions, not an increase, and they're not uh, you know, working in a collaborative way to try to uh, you know, address those, that issue and to make sure that um, you know, there's hiring that's efficient and effective that will result in the net increase in positions. So there's so much still that I would love to keep unpacking, but I wanna zoom out a little bit just to give some context to the real consequences of this problem. Um, we can see how this affects members who are overworked because of understaffing. Yes. And also it's an issue for potential workers who would love these good paying jobs, working for the government, doing a public service. But I also wanna talk about how this affects the Rhode Island public. Um, how does this affect everyday Rhode Islanders? It affects a lot. Uh, you, to be uh, a lot of folks would be surprised how much how, ma how much millions of dollars is put in into the uh, communities, like the province, one of the largest uh, community in Rhode Island. The second largest is Pawtucket, then followed by Warwick, and then Woonsocket, then Middletown, and uh, the there's, uh, the working class families depends on this benefits that DHS provide. And especially when they 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 are they are the lowest earners in our state, they they work in the minimal jobs, they work in factories, they work in in, uh, in service, meaning uh, hotels, restaurants, those, those type of you know services. They get paid the minimum wage, and they don't work full time, so they supplement their household income by applying for stamp benefits, and also for the health care that is not often provided if you have a part time job or employment in the state of Atlanta. So they apply for, for this, for the state Medicaid. So not having enough staff to process their applications and they read their terminations to, so they way can continue receiving benefits affects the public. Uh, I know that the Senate has requested uh, data and information. They did an analysis indicating that all the states, since the pandemic is almost over, they saw a rise in uh, uh, of, for, uh, uh, the public applying for SNAP benefits while Rhode Island was going down, uh, which is basically, it's, it's a reflection of what is happening at DHS. We do not have enough staff to process those applications. Therefore, our numbers of authorizing benefits to the public has gone down as well. And I was just at a, a DHS office recently, um, and there was about 20 people out the door. That's not including all the people inside. And there were there were kids outside, and it was didn't feel it didn't feel warm. So I looked at my uh, weather app, and I go down. I looked at like with the wind chill, you know, factor what the temperature was, and it was in the mid forties. Um, and you have people out there in uh, chilly uh, weather with kids uh, who should probably uh, you know be at work, or they would be at work, or they have other places to be. Um, and even when they're getting served, uh, they're not fully getting their issues addressed just because of the log jams and uh, everything being so uh, chaotic. Um, are the way the systems are set up is that um, they're trying to 
uh, respond when people come to the office in a very piecemeal way, which isn't basically they can come to the office and not address all their issues at once, meaning they have to come back uh, multiple times, uh, losing time from work, um, going without uh, food stamps, which they need for food security, um, going without uh, cash benefit payments. Uh, and these are the most neediest uh, and vulnerable, uh, you know, Rhode Islanders. Uh, so it's it's a real it's a real crisis, and the response is from the state uh, is to let's kind of present that hey uh, we're we're doing we have our challenges, but hey we're making progress. Well, that's not the reality that our workers come on uh, see on the ground, and that's not what we see our workers see when they're looking at the eyes of you know constituents or consumers coming in, um, you know, desperate. We were at a an event in February. In, a, in front of a DHS office and a woman with cancer came up desperate, speaking Spanish um, and uh, trying to communicate, struggling to communicate. Um, and thankfully, uh, we were, uh, uh, Rafael was able to in, in, interpret and uh, she was going out, going without with her, the benefits she was trying to get was on the phone, was trying to get to the office and was like desperate, like pleading for help. And then someone else came up with another uh, story that wasn't too far off from that. Uh, so I think that really encapsulates the the desperation, and unfortunately, you know, because of some of these, um, a lot of these folks being disenfranchised and marginalized, like they don't have a voice. Um, so hoping, uh, you know, this is an opportunity in a forum to try to be a voice for uh, folks who otherwise don't have it. So, yeah, I mean, I I can't imagine like you think about all the normal bureaucracy that people have to deal with, but then have to constantly be becoming an advocate and not being able to accomplish a simple thing as an application in one go, just one visit to DHS or one phone call um, to keep going back. It has to be very emotionally and mentally taxing um, for the person who's seeking the benefit, but also for the worker who's frustrated that they can't help right away. Yes. Um, so I, I want to circle back to a comment that Matt had made earlier about a request that you had made to the Department of Administration and only getting part of the information that you had requested. Um, what is the issue? Why don't we fully know what the numbers are, what the vacancies are, what the exact situation is? Yeah, well, I, uh, that's a good question. So, you know, when we're requesting some information from DHS, uh, they direct us to DOA. Uh, we request information from DOA, uh, you know, direct us to DHS. Uh, so the information that I cited was just through advocating and asking questions. And I actually didn't get that from DOA or DHS. The way we kind of really came to the understanding of what the real vacancy rate um, is from, you know, reaching out, um, talking to legislative colleagues um, and uh, getting information provided that the state provides regarding all their agencies, regarding how many positions um, you know, each um, agency has. Um, and we were able to compare that to, oh, wow, that's 11 less than what they reported having in January. And wow, that really contradicts the fact that the messaging is, is that we filled 49 of 71 positions without um, communicating that we actually have a net loss of uh, positions. Um, so it's it's been a real challenge, um, and I'm not sure what the resistance is. Um, have a lot of speculations, but again, it comes back to transparency, and that if we're not going to be forthcoming um, about what the issue is, then it's going to just get exasperated. I mean, that's that's how we got to this place where um, you know positions went vacant in 2020 and weren't posted to 2020 in the beginning of 2021 after people started asking questions and stuff started coming up in the media. And now we're at this kind of rush um, to you know, fill positions, but still not doing it effectively, but without being transparent about the lack of significant progress since the February oversight hearing, then we're again trying to catch up uh, to address it now. And it's just, the issue just gets compounded rather if there was some collaboration. I mean, we've asked since February 2nd um, to have a meeting with the governor's office uh, the Department of Administration and DHS to sit down at the table and get down to the crux of what the uh, of the hiring to make sure that um, the hiring is done and efficiently and effectively, and they can onboard people to get in that positions. That has that hasn't happened. We are sure that would happen multiple times, um, but it hasn't. But their narrative is 
they have a narrative. I don't know if you want to speak to Raphael, but we came to the table and we said, hey, listen, if there's something we need to do to amend in our contract, we can help with. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to speak to that. And then there was never any follow through with it. And actually, we found out about some proposal they have about that in February at an oversight hearing without it being directly discussed with us before that or after that. Yeah, I mean, we, we met with, uh, with the governor's uh, uh, folks and trying to find a resolution to this issue that we have at hand with the uh, Raphael, the position at DHS. Uh, through our meetings, we tried to advocate and, and, and try to have a meaningful conversation, an open dialogue of the, the, of the situation that's happening. And it's simple. We have, a, we have lost uh, a lot of workers that can help, with, help the public. Unfortunately, that, didn't, that, that did not uh, come through. Uh, they actually, in, in the Senate hearing, in, and I believe this was in February, uh, the acting director then announced publicly that they were working with labor, trying to come up with an agreement. That was news to me because I have not met with management regarding coming up with an agreement. Actually, I've been asking management to backfill the positions. I said, why? Because those positions are already funded. So where's the funds? For those positions, why you haven't backfilled the positions since 2020? I mean, I, it's, it's, I have the data. I mean, when I lose a member, I, I get a report when one of my members move from my from my from my department to another department, uh, and I keep track of my members. I lost since 2020, close to over 100 uh, members. 100 members I lost. Out of 100, about 44, 40 to 44 are frontline workers. That includes the, the LSA technicians who approve the benefits. That, that also means the clerical who help the technicians to process the applications, to process the documents, so we can provide the services. And then we, uh, we also have interpreters in uh, multiple languages, Spanish, uh, Portuguese. Uh, uh, what's the other language that, that is very that is growing up now? Yeah. Uh, I believe it's uh, Russian. And we now the state has to contract out for the services. So those interpreters, close to 10 of them, I lost them the past uh, two years. It's not, that is not helping the public. We are, we're not providing good service to the public, which is sad for most state in, in the union, in the state, United States, that we cannot afford with enough staff and personnel to help the public who are the most needed in Hawaii. And at that February hearing, um, the outgoing acting director at that time um, stated that um, she was recommending 90 more additional positions be funded in the budget. That's not, has nothing to do with the vacancies that are funded already that are not filled. Um, so when um, Representative Solomon uh, on the oversight committee asked, so you're making a recommendation for those positions, but they're not in the governor's current proposal. So are there, is there gonna be amended a, a budget amendment from the governor's proposal adding those positions? And the acting director said that was her recommendation, um, but I haven't, I haven't seen any updated budget amendment from the governor's mm -hmm. proposal. And she was saying that was needed just to address the workloads. That on top of the funded positions we have now that are not vacant, we need 90 more to address the, the workloads and get sure. to be able to respond within to the within the timelines the feds have um, for uh, timelines they have for response times regarding um, food stamps, you know, for, for example. And so on. Yeah. yeah. And even April on uh, April 5th. Uh, the Department of Food and Nutrition Service from the United States Department of Agriculture uh, wrote a letter to DHS and it uh, states um, FNS seeks to ensure that DHS has a staffing in IT resources to meet the needs of SNAP clients. Uh, and then they make, a, they make a reference to in another sentence regarding staffing shortages. So the feds are, not, are, are, are aware that this is a, a problem as well. A, a serious problem. And the, and the whole up, I don't know. I, I really don't know because the, the process of hiring uh, employees hasn't changed in, in years. Uh, there's such as uh, Hawaiian statutes uh, that actually addresses those things. And we are, keep asking to, to, you know, to backfill the positions, but management and DOA, they are reluctant to give, to provide us with a real reason why it's the holdup when the funds are available for this position, they are funded. Right. And yet the agency and management are dragging their feet to do the backfill. So they are providing a, a service to the public. The public is the one who's suffering for not, not receiving the benefits that are entitled for, or they may qualify for to help their families, especially now that the economy is tanking. I mean, 
If you go out to buy a gallon of milk, you, you see the price has gone up. Bread, all the, all the daily sta staples. Those are families who actually get the lowest paid in our state. They work the minimum jobs. You know, if you're a parent, you're gonna have a, a very difficult to hold a full-time job. So they have working part-time. So they depend on the servicer from the, from the state to supplement the, the needs in their home. And, and we are not providing that service to the public at all. And a neighbor is trying to help somewhat, but we only have so much uh, power and control of the hiring and, and, and processes. That is a management uh, tool, not a union tool. We, we had basically to protect our workers' right within the agency. Yes, it, uh, and to that compound things even more, <laughs> Um, since 2014, um, they have um, reduced um, our social, the social caseworkers we have by about 66% um, and reduced those positions by about 70. So that doesn't mean they laid off 70 people, but what that does mean is what they, what they were doing, what they appear they were doing here, where they don't, you know, the position goes vacant on April 24th, 2020, and doesn't get advertised until January 19th, 2022. Were they like, just like they did with the social caseworker positions and over time, they didn't refill 70 of those? Was that the intent uh, for this position we're referring to, which eligibility technician? Because um, what happened around January is when the media and the legislature put all this pressure. Um, but those 70 positions got lost because the position went vacant uh, and then they didn't fill it and over time lost 70. And th those those folks provide critical uh, services so uh, and, and, yeah, and assess people to try to even the elderly um, folks that have disabilities um, to try to keep them in their home um, and try to prevent them from going to nursing homes. Um, we would have people out in the field meeting with them, assessing them. Um, and that level of response is not happening because of those positions. And uh, I was talking to a worker the other day, uh, she's an employment and career advisor. And um, so people that need cash assistance and employment assistance um, could have a various amount of other issues going on in their life. Mm -hmm. um, so before, they would, they would have, a, a, when they had more staff, is that a supervisor would get uh, the referrals and that um, and a, a worker would get a caseload and that worker would call them back and be able to give them the time and attention they need. If it's a serious domestic violence case, they could be on the phone for a half, for, I'm saying for an hour. If it's something not as um, urgent, it could be 15 minutes. Now, because they're trying to, um, you know, try to show people that they're, people their weights on the phones are going down it's just like a free-for-all so they're putting everybody on the phones um and this person now rather than having a caseload which she can plan out her day to outreach people she has a call line of like when i was visiting at the office seven people on hold on her screen why she's trying to meet the needs of the the person on the phone um which is very uh <laughs> very inefficient and not not That's helpful right. or you can't meet you can't meet the people where they're at they're people you know what i mean they're humans uh, you know, DHS, Department of Human Services, uh, is taking the human out of human services. And that's just kind of like an example. Hey, let's do better on this metric. Um, and let's, you know, put seven people uh, uh, on, on hold while you're trying to have this conversation as like a, like a, you know, like a social worker would do to try to meet the person where they're at. Um, but how can you, how can you pay attention to them? How can you give attention to somebody with serious issues if you have to worry about the seven people on your screen? Uh, that you get to. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And that's because we don't have enough staff. Workers and our staff, yeah. And there, I just, I also am remembering a previous conversation we had had that related to like short staffing, but also this lack of transparency and COVID, where there are and have been COVID outbreaks that take workers away from their work but also there's a lack of transparency of sharing when one worker has COVID to prevent other workers from also catching COVID. And so I'm wondering like, what is this like, has this issue been continuing as the COVID pandemic? It has, like it has. Uh, let me uh, address that. Um, the sec our second largest office right now is Pawtucket. Uh, they see a great number of, of, uh, of the public. And you know, the Pawtucket, Central Falls, they're, they're mill towns. Uh, back in the days, in the 60s, 70s, there was, there was a lot of mills. So most of the population in, in the city of Pawtucket, in the town of Pawtucket, they, again, they work the, you know, they work the, the small jobs. They, you know, they lowest paid and so on. And most recent, uh, for the third time uh, since 2020, 
we had an outbreak in our Pawtucket office. Uh, we cut we cut wind of it because our members were reaching out to 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 me as the president to advocate on the behalf because they they caught COVID at the office. Yeah, they were not they were denied uh, administration time because they needed to be out you know out of the office so they're infected other workers. What happened was a I guess what the, a couple of workers came in vaccinated came into the office interacted with their coworkers during meetings and so on and started spreading. Within a week, uh, about eight, nine of them reached out to us indicating that, hey, I tested positive I, and uh, I need to be out and they're telling me I have to discharge my, my, you know, my, my sick time when I contracted in the office. So we reached out to the proper administration, what's going on, why the union and our coworkers have not been informed that we have a potential outbreak. Uh, within that week, uh, it was already nine. The following weekend, uh, they, they're bringing the folks from the Department of Health. They started doing PCR testing and, and, uh, and simple tests, and they found out 28 employees were positive, okay? The first round of testing happened on a Tuesday. Then the second round of testing happened on a Thursday. By, date, by that date, we had 38 total oh my God. positive in that office. Now, half of that office is remote working, teleworking, uh, doing the services, you know, via the, uh, the phone lines, meaning when you call DHS, you are reaching a worker remotely working from home. Uh, that was almost half of the staff at DHS in Pawtucket were infected with COVID. The department was not transparent. They did not notify our members. They did not notify labor that we have a problem. Only when we brought it to the attention you know, they, 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 they know about it, but they were not sharing that information with the coworkers, <coughs> excuse me. So our coworkers they were not able to make an informed decision. Hey, I don't want to come into the office. I can, remote, I can work remotely because we have an outbreak at, at the office. Instead, they contacted COVID at home. I had an employee who was teleworking since 2020 because she took a higher position. She was has to come back to the office to be retrained. Never tested positive until she came back to the office. Now her family was at risk because she was positive. So she was home, he, she brought COVID at home because she contracted her work. So this agency, the private administration and the DHS, they work, uh, I, I, the best way I can explain it, like they don't like to share information. They withhold information intentionally. So our workers in the public, they're not aware of what is happening. And that is, it's unheard of this time. So, I mean, we're supposed to be providing public service and we're not. As Matt said, we are the primary in human services, unfortunate, because we don't, have, we don't have the compassion internally and we do, we do not help our coworkers internally, our workforce, nevertheless, the public. It's, it's, it's sad, sad days ahead of us, the way I'm, I'm looking at it. It's, it's very sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they didn't notify the public practically. So they're saying that they're aware for the first time that someone tested positive on April 28th for that outbreak, uh, but that they knew seven people on April 28th uh, were positive in the office. However, they did not notify our office, just a general email so people can take precautions. Um, uh, and that's a concern. They didn't tell the public. Um, we asked, hey, like if you're having people come in, you're leaving the office open. I understand that's. Um, a decision you're going to make. Uh, you're saying that you're going to let, you know, offer people masks, which wasn't even being done consistently. Um, but you're not telling them that, hey, there's a COVID situation here and give them full discretion. Hey, do you want to come in with a mask? Not a mask. Do you want to go to another office? And it wasn't until uh, we had a press conference uh, on a Thursday that later that Thursday that they did, uh, they put out a press release on their website um, but still had no signage up um, at the uh, at the Pawtucket office building, despite our our requests. <sighs> I don't know. It's just I really appreciate the advocacy that you are doing on behalf of your members and also on behalf of the Red Island public. This is such a daunting and pressing issue. Um, so for for people like me who are not directly affected or connected to DHS, for other Rhode Islanders and people who might be listening at home, like what can we do to help? 
con contact your your representative legislators. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, they need to make, they need to be aware of what is happening because the department appears they're not transparent. They're not really forthcoming, providing you know accurate information and right uh, correct information so the public can make an informed decision. Even the workers internally, they don't feel safe. They don't trust management because when they behave and act in a certain way, you know, with secrecy, it's not helpful in the workforce, especially in public service. We are public agency. We're supposed to be helping the public. If we're not transparent internally, it is hard for the public to trust us. So yeah. I, I think we need to have our, our legislators to be informed so they can actually scrutinize what is happening in our city agencies, even the governor as well. Uh, they need to know what is happening, excuse me, <clears throat> with DHS. Yeah, I definitely think uh, anybody watching, um, you know, take a, a few moments, you know, 60 seconds uh, to write something brief asking, hey, we're aware of all these issues going on at DHS. Um, uh, to send an email to your state senator, your state rep, mm -hmm. and say, hey, we need some urgent action. Please bring this to the attention of the, the House leadership and the, the Senate leadership. Yeah. Uh, there, there needs to be a real urgency, a real concrete actual plan uh, by the governor to fill these positions efficiently uh, and effectively. That focuses on net increase in total positions to actually address the backlogs and workloads. Yes. And, and also accountability of the administrators. I mean, they're supposed to be providing service to the public. And right now, I don't see it. It's, it's very difficult for labor to work with uh, an administration that they're not transparent. There's always like hidden agenda. There's always something else. And so when you're trying to negotiate agreements and contract not done in good faith, it's, it's, it's difficult. You lose the trust. Yeah. And then you know, then the workers themselves, they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel safe. And this is why another reason a lot of workers they actually are leaving DHS, you know, to another sister agency away from this chaos, internal chaos that we're having. And it's not helping the public at all. Yeah, we really have a, a, a top-down uh, management style. Um, and we're supposed to be a human services agency. Uh, but we don't even have a culture where, you know, we are treated, our workers are treated in a way that we're expected to treat the people coming in the front door, who we want, who we want to help, right? That's a ripple effect. The more exhausted and stressed and uh, that feeling of walking on eggshells workers have from working in this under-resourced, understaffed and chaotic environment um, is not helpful for all the reasons why we explain. But those people that are there that are in a position that's not vacant yet, a lot of people are looking to leave. I was talking to a worker yesterday. She said she throws up on the way to work. She's a seasoned worker. And she's like, you know what? I can't do it anymore. I'll go somewhere else for less pay. And, and there's not like a, a, a process of people feeling like, you know, that if they can bring issues and concerns um, to the attention uh, of uh, management in general, I'd say management in general, and feel like, hey, that, you know, that they'll address those concerns and try to find solutions. Um, so we should be, we should be embracing our frontline workers and finding out from them what works well, uh, how do we continue to do that, what's not working well, and hey, what ideas and solutions do you have, rather than being told and told and told. Um, we hear from members that we have a, who do quality assurance that they get messages that that they're responsible for finding errors, and we get we're audited by the feds for having too many errors, um, and they're getting messages. Hey, um, you know, you know, to send a message that it's not great to find errors. Like that's a message, um, and even if it's implicit, <laughs> um, how does that get to the bottom of why we're creating errors to begin with? It's this kind yeah. of like. We're in a terrible cycle right now, um, and there needs to be real leadership to, to, to make reforms, or things are just going get, to uh, get worse. Okay, well, um, at that note, I am going to provide information in the show notes for how people can reach out to their legislators. I believe that there's a petition that I can connect people to so that they can send out these quick messages to bring this really important matter to the intention of their local representatives and to the governor. 
Um, anything else that we can do, I will make our viewers and listeners aware of through the Rhode Island AFL social websites and through the Labor Vision accounts to try and connect people to this information. But thank you both so much for coming on, for sharing this issue with us. Um, we really hope that we can help you push and create more of that pressure that is needed at DHS um, to you know, get these positions filled and to provide that service to the public. So thank you both so much. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Autumn, and thank you for the AFL-CIO for uh, you know, hosting such an important uh, venue to make uh, workers' voices heard, uh, such as Labor Vision. So we appreciate all you do. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.